Alex Matheson, October 26, 2000, at the WCG TV studios in Brandon, Manitoba. Can you tell us your name and what your rank was in the Air Force? Alec Matheson, and uh, I started out at an AC-2 and I ended up my career in the Air Force as a pilot officer. And where'd you grow up, Alex? Vancouver, British Columbia on the sunny southern slope. Um, and it was sort of interesting because from uh, the district I lived in, Marple, where I lived all my life, um, you could see the airplanes taken off and landing out in Sea Island at the airport. And from an early age, I was really interested in, in flight. And uh, I saved up my money helping a, a lad do papers and went out and had my first flight, I guess it was 20 minutes when I was nine, in this old biplane. And I was just thrilled to death. I, that's what I wanted to do. And I collected pictures. I had a drawer full of pictures. I knew every plane that was flying in the sky around there. When the war started, is, was that your thought then, I'm going to be a pilot? Oh, yes. I was 14 when the war started. And uh, uh, my interest in becoming a pilot was increasing all the time. And as activity out in Sea Island increased, different aircraft came in, and that further stimulated my desire to become a, a pilot. I figure, like most teenagers, I was young and harebrained and felt that you could end the war yourself. Um, and that's all I wanted to do. School was of no interest. I really just wanted to be a pilot. And uh, I was so excited when the first time I saw Bristol Blenheim, a squadron was flying in and out of uh, Vancouver. Hanley Page Hamptons came in. Uh, and the first time I saw Kitty Hawk, I nearly went berserk. I thought that was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. And one, one day I was sitting down at the kitchen table and I heard this roar which I hadn't heard before. And I excused myself and ran out the front door and looked up and a hawker hurricane was flying over. I was speechless and I ran in and told my mom, I said, Mom, there's a hawker hurricane flying over. She's not interested in airplanes of any type. Oh, she said, that's good. So I dashed back out. and uh, this, this kept me interested all the time. Plus, in high school, uh, by the time I got to high school, they had air cadets. And we got a uniform, and once a week we paraded, and we had classes in uh, Morse code, aircraft recognition, uh, the basic theory of flight, a little bit about engines, uh, the type of thing that they thought would stimulate your desire to go into the Air Force, and it certainly did mine. Did you have any family members who served? Oh, just, uh, well, my, I had one brother who was younger than me, or I have one brother younger than me, and uh, my dad was in the First World War, and he was wounded twice and gassed once. Uh, Mum really was an English war bride because she uh, tended to dad or nursed him when he was convalescing uh, after his second wound, which was rather serious, in England. And he brought her back to Canada. Uh, but my experience as a teenager in, at that stage of the war, you're not really involved. We were so removed from the conflict itself. Uh, the only thing we really saw were the aircraft far different from living in a place like Halifax where the troop ships were going out, the convoys were coming in and going up. We didn't have that sort of thing in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and if you're busy, which I was as a teenager, you, you don't, there was no TV. Uh, the only real clips you ever got were on uh, RKO news reels, which were on the movies all the time, uh, or the radio. And radios weren't as prevalent then as they are now. Uh, every kid carries one around in his, on his waist. We didn't do that. So you weren't really involved in any other way other than your own interest and maybe the, your odd friend that suddenly disappeared. He had up and enlisted. Mm -hmm. um, the message started to get through when 
casualties started to come in. Uh, there was a family across the street from us, two boys enlisted in the RCAF. And uh, I recall the news when uh, on one raid over Germany, they were both in different airplanes, but they both were lost on the same night. And that was pretty shattering to the family and the whole street. So this was when the news started to become a little more serious. It, uh, you know, flying though, you never thought you were going to get hurt or injured or you were invulnerable, as most teenagers think they are. So when you became of age, did you run right away to go and enlist? Yeah, actually, uh, I have a great birthday. It's the 1st of April. And uh, I, I went right down to the recruiting depot and uh, got my name in, and they told me they'd phone me when to come down. I came back and to school, and I was cleaning out my locker to leave. And uh, one of my teachers, a uh, Mr. Thomas, delightful man, the type of man you always remember, happened to see me doing this. And he said, what are you doing? I told him. And he said, well, he just left me with, don't get your hopes too high. And he left. and. He went back to his office, and he phoned the recruiting depot and told them uh, not to accept me until I'd finished the term in school, which was great, you know, really. I was really upset, but uh, in, in reality, uh, he was doing the right thing, and he was thinking of my future career. Yeah. How, go ahead. How did your family react when you wanted to enlist? How did your mom feel? Well, Mom, <clears throat> Mom never said too much. I know she felt a lot, but Mom was uh, very sensitive. Uh, she wouldn't come and watch me play lacrosse. Uh, she wouldn't watch me dive off the 10-meter tower. Uh, this was more than she can endure. Dad, being an old soldier, uh, was proud, I think, that I wanted to enlist. Uh, he didn't want to see me go, but uh, it was in the family, and uh, it wasn't too bad, really. But at that time, unlike now when kids who are 16, 17, 18, they've traveled all over North America, many all over the world. The farthest I'd been away from home at that time was Seattle, 80 miles away. So uh, this was quite an adventure. What happened once you got the call? You were done school, and, and off you went. Where did you go? Well, I went to Manning Depot uh, in Edmonton, and uh, there you got your basics. You were, you were kitted out. And you got your inoculations, which were always a, a shock, because I don't know what it was. I think it was TABT, which was the, the potent one. But half the group that I was with uh, couldn't get out of bed in the morning. We just lay in the bed and groaned. We had, we were hot and feverish and headaches. Felt truly terrible. But uh, then we had uh, marching and drill and how to salute and come to attention. All the basics, which I I had because I was a, I was pipe sergeant at the Seaforth Cadet Pipe Band. So I got all the drill that everybody got. So I was a wee bit ahead. Of, I felt rather good. <laughs> uh, How do you, you adjust to the lack of privacy? All these men uh, together, sleeping yeah. quarters. Yeah, you're, you're sort of thrown together. <clears throat> you, uh, you're so concerned with keeping up, uh, being on schedule, being on time. You didn't want to be late for anything, because if you were late, then you were confined to barracks. Uh, but uh, I didn't mind it. It wasn't too bad. And uh, you, uh, you quickly adjust. You do like privacy, but you don't get it in a block with 60 or, well, 30 or 60 people in it. Gosh. Uh, even the bathrooms weren't very private, I've heard. No, the bathrooms stories. weren't private at all. But uh, I, I laugh at one thing. Uh, you pick up little trades and skills. When I uh, finally got to uh, 
elementary flying. I'm jumping ahead here, maybe. <laughs> we'll go back. <laughs> That's uh, okay. When I was at uh, elementary flying school up in Prince Albert, I was the only Canadian on the course. The rest were from the UK. And uh, I remember going into the shower in this, our half, the H hut. And, uh, here are these three fellows in there. They're all wearing their shirts, their underwear, and their socks. And I, I'm looking at this, and I, I'm wondering, what in heaven's name are they doing? They were washing their clothes and getting a shower at the same time, which was rather a clever idea, actually. Because, uh, none of the lads were too adept at washing things. So I ended up doing the same thing, and it was a quick way of doing it. Then the only thing you had to iron was the collar. The rest was underneath your jacket, your battle dress jacket. So you ended up just doing your collar on your shirt. Tricks of the trade, I guess. Mm -hmm. How long were you at Manning Depot? I think I was there two months. It wasn't long. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, of course, you're from all over the country. And uh, you meet people from all over. I met one lad from uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, Cape Britain. And uh, my grandmother, who was born in Cape Britain, used to uh, tell me about her uncle Angus. And uh, this man was a big man. He was seven foot nine. He weighed uh, uh, 435 pounds and he had a 76 inch chest. And I later found out he was called the Cape Breton Giant. And uh, of course they all look at me and said, what happened? <laughs> I said he tried to cross a barbed wire fence and it didn't work. Huh. But I asked this fellow, I said, I, I took him aside and I said, uh, see I, by now I didn't know whether Angus McCaskill was fact or fiction, because my grandmother died when I was about eight, I think. And uh, so I said, have, have you ever heard of a man named Giant Angus McCaskill? And he looked at me, he says, Lord Jesus, man, I stood on his grave. So he was, in fact, a human being, and he lived. And since that time, I've <clears throat> run into people who knew more about him. Uh, a, pre a president of Pine Hill University in Halifax, and he sent me a booklet on Giant Angus McCaskill. And the stories in there were exactly what my grandmother told me. So he, in fact, is a very distant relative. Oh. Which was sort of fun. Wow. But that was uh, one of the one of the, the highlights in uh, uh -huh. in Manning Depot. What about uh, men from other countries at Manning Depot? Were there any? No, not at our, not at uh, not, uh -huh. not there. I think I would think most of the the fellows would go through their own Manning Depots, in their like Australia or uh, England or Wales or whatever, uh -huh. and then when they came over, they had their uniforms, they had their kit, and they went right into the training plan. Right. Uh -huh. Did your uniform fit you? <laughs> Everything but my shoes. Um, I have a funny foot. It's only five and a half long and five e wide. It's more square than it is rectangular. And uh, shoes were always a problem, so I usually had to get them about two, two and a half sizes longer than I should get them. So they invariably ended turning up. And uh, I was on inspection, I guess it was at uh, ITS, and uh, we're standing in front of our beds. And the seal came along and he looked up. And here are these shoes of mine. And they're up like this. He can't even see the toes, just the soles. And said, what in hell are those? My shoes, sir. Why are they turned up? So I had to tell him, they're longer than I need, but that's the only thing I can get into. So I had to go and buy another pair. And they were my display pair. They were up there all the time. But other than that, uh, no, the clothing was pretty good. I never had problems. What about the food? Food? I found the food uh, quite adequate. You got bored with it every once in a while. But um, later on in my training, training we were introduced to uh, freeze-dried food like potatoes, 
and uh, freeze-dried uh, coleslaw. Uh, this wasn't very nice. Not at that time, anyway. Right now, now they're good. But they hadn't perfected the technique. I think they were trying it out on us. It wasn't that good. But we, we had good meals, and they looked after us. So, do you remember the date that you arrived at ITS in Prince Albert? Yeah, I arrived in ITS in, uh, it'd be October, around the 1st of October, 40, uh, 43. And, of course, that was the real start of your training. That's when you, you were launched into preparation for uh, air crew. And, uh, Without exception, uh, the lads all, I, ne I never worked so hard in my life at an in an academic environment. I didn't in high school. I don't think many boys do. But there you did because you really had a goal. And you applied yourself to uh, theory of flight and navigation. And I, was, uh, I, I knew Morse code because I'd been an air cadet. I knew aircraft recognition because I of my interest. So I had to jump up on some things. Uh, navigation wasn't my strong point, and maybe that's why the, I never became a navigator. But uh, So in the early weeks, the first weeks, were, was all your time spent in a classroom then? Just oh, yes. doing yeah, courses? Yeah, two months in there. You never wow. got out of the classroom. <clears throat> they had great, they're good instructors, they had great training aids. But it was a, uh, we were actually in the uh, University of Alberta um, quarters. Uh, four of us were in what had been the dean's room. And that's, uh, that's where we were billeted and we had our, our classrooms were there too. Okay. Sorry, Alex, you were still in Edmonton for ITS. Yep, okay. Edmonton. Sorry, I was thinking Prince Albert. No. Nope. That's later on. That was later on. Okay. Uh, the highlight of, uh, or the, the period of relaxation was always going down to the canteen at night for a Coke or whatever, you know. I was a non-drinker, so I'd go down for a Coke. And it was always great. I'll never forget ITS, because there was a, an airman there named uh, Bert Niosi. And Bert Niosi uh, used to play in a group called the Happy Gang, and they were on radio for years very, very popular right across Canada. He joined and he was an airman at ITS. He came and played the piano and I don't, I don't imagine he ever bought a drink in his whole life because they plied him with drinks as long as he'd play, they'd, they'd feed him. And, uh, but he was a great fellow and we thoroughly enjoyed him. But it was sort of a thrill to sit beside this fellow who you had heard on the radio mm -hmm. and watch him play. Would there be dances? Uh, no, we didn't have any dances. Uh, no. You're only there for two months, so you don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're just busy working. Would you ever then head into Edmonton and see the sites? Would you have time? No, I think I, I, don't, I don't believe I ventured into Edmonton more than once or twice, maybe on the weekend, but mm. uh, just had a lot to do, and I, I didn't want to wash out Everybody felt the same way. No one wanted to, to fail just because you didn't apply yourself. And uh, I think that uh, my biggest shock came at the end when uh, we completed training and we paraded on the parade square. And uh, they're calling out the names of those who are going to various schools. And at the time, everybody that uh, was going in for pilot's training were hoping they'd go to Abbotsford because they had just received the, the Cornell. This was a new trainer. Uh, low wing monoplane, but it looked more like an airplane than a Tiger Moth. And uh, everybody's name had been called out and they were going to different places and I'm the last one on the parade square. And I'm starting to wonder, yeah, maybe I didn't pass. And I'm starting to get worried. And uh, finally, I cranked up little, uh, enough courage to ask the flight sergeant. I said, flight, did you forget me? <laughs> and he looked at me with, with a little smile. And he says, no, Matheson, I didn't forget you. 
All short asses go to Prince Albert on the Tiger Mott. Then you can reach the pedals. So I went to Prince Albert. <laughs> and I ended up there. I, uh, uh, I was the only Canadian on the course. The rest were from the UK. And it was, it was very interesting. Too. Was it an RAF school then? No, Alex? oh no, no. no? Okay. Uh, the Commonwealth Air Training Plan trained people from all over Australia, New Zealand, uh, Norwegians. Mm -hmm. um, so there may it, have been other others, but I never ran into them. But okay. oodles from the UK. So it just so happened that very few Canadians went to the school at the time that you Well, were I there. was the only one that ended up there on that course. Wow. And it was interesting. So uh, when did you start to train in the planes? As soon as you got there? Uh, no, we uh, got there early December. And uh, they put us all to work doing Joe jobs. You were washing, cleaning, painting. Uh, one of the jobs was uh, what they called the peanut wagon, which was a station wagon with a, a glass top on it. And uh, it would drive out onto the, the field. And you would sit in there. And uh, you had an Aldous lamp with uh, either a red or a, a green uh, light on it. And the planes would taxi out to where you were. And when they were ready to go, they'd wiggle their tail. And you would look, make sure nothing was coming in or taking off, or in front of them, give them a green light, and they would take off. And uh, uh, there were no, uh, there was no radio communications on a Tiger Moth. Actually, it was fairly primitive. Uh, the communication was, you spoke to the instructor who was in the front seat through a funnel, which went into a piece of garden hose through to the front seat. And then it divided into two little tubes that went over his ear. And, uh, and they had a little cap on. That's how he heard you. And he spoke to you through a funnel that <laughs> came back into your ears. And that's the only communication you had. It was also cold. I had never, ever been so cold in all my life as I was there. And of course, on the West Coast in Vancouver, generally in the winter, you rarely even see snow. And uh, I remember one once at home when I was a kid, it snowed. I think it was about four or five inches, and they closed the schools for a week. Nothing could get, or get around the city. There, it was 60 below, and we were still, oh, we didn't fly at 60 below. This was Fahrenheit. We flew up to uh, 30 degrees below zero. And uh, there was no heat in the plane either. <laughs> It was cold. Gee, did the weather ever affect the equipment so that it wouldn't work um, properly? Well, yeah, we had good, uh, with, they were well serviced, and uh, I never had any engine problems, and no one in my class did. Um, what it did do sometimes was you would fog up uh, inside the, the hatch. It was plexiglass, and you it was so cold that your air hit the, the plexiglass and freeze, and you're scraping the ice off the, off the window to see out. And sometimes it was very difficult, which was frustrating. You might have to open the hatch to even see out sometimes. It was fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you had great big flying boots on over your shoes. Sometimes you could. I had trouble feeling anything, you know, because you have so much insulation there. That was interesting. Do you remember your first flight out with an instructor? Oh, yeah. I, I thought I was going to be washed out. Um, we took off, and I'm, of course, the instructor's always in the front seat. And I'm sitting there, and I am thrilled to death, just thrilled to death. The tiger moth, of course, we're flying, we're flying on skis. Uh, the, the, the airfield was really just a flat area of grass, and the snow had been rolled down by big rollers. And then they went over the field and, and dropped little bits of uh, fir boughs on the, on the top of it so you could judge where it was. Otherwise, it w you'd get what you call whiteout. You didn't know where the ground was, but these little branches would help you. 
So, you, but anyway, the plane's on skis. We took off, and up we went, and we're flying, and we're turning slowly. And he speaks, and he said, how are you enjoying it? I said, oh, great. <clears throat> so he said, uh, mind if I do a loop? No, no. So he did a loop, another loop. Now I'm not feeling all that chipper. And then he said, how about a roll? I said, I don't care what you do. <laughs> I don't feel very good now. So he, he did a slow roll, and at the end of it, he, uh, he slipped into a spin. Well, by now I'm sick, and I unhooked the hatch, threw it back, and threw, out, threw up outside, hit the slipstream, came back all over me. Oh, I figure I'm going to get washed out. I'll ne they'll never accept me. When we got land, he came right back to the airport. We landed, and uh, he didn't even look at me. He said, just, he got out and he just said, clean it up. <laughs> he left it. And I had to go and get a bucket. I wasn't the only one. There were quite a few doing the same thing. But after that, you got that over with, uh, I settled down. When you're actually flying, you're concentrating on something else other than the pressures on your stomach. And, uh, and that was the only time I threw up, really. Hmm. Pretty good. Yeah, I <laughs> felt good. I didn't want to be like that all the time. Uh, how, many, uh, how many hours, how many flights before you went solo? I don't know. Did well, I, got, I soloed after five and a half hours of uh, dual instruction. Only five. Yeah, five and a half hours, which was pretty good, actually. But, uh, and Solo was, was a really exciting adventure. I, the first time to take off and float around on your own without anyone else beside you is an absolutely exhilarating experience. It was wonderful. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Some people react differently. differently. Uh, one of the lads on one of the other courses during the, during the time there on his solo flight, he took off and he froze at the stick. Oh. <laughs> he just, just kept flying straight ahead. Well, he, he eventually ran out of gas about 150, 200 miles south of the uh, of Prince Albert. And he made a beautiful landing in this farmer's field and uh, got into the, uh, the farmhouse and managed to phone the aerodrome. And they flew an instructor out there and another one and they managed to get the airplane back. Wasn't damaged, and he did very well, but that was the end of his career. Oh. You can only freeze the, the stick so often. Uh -huh. But uh, fortunately, it ended uh, on a happy note. Uh -huh. but it, the instructor was going berserk. But there goes my student. He's gone. <laughs> what? what were the instructors like? Uh, at Prince Albert, they were um, they weren't Air Force instructors. They were civilian. Civilians. It was run like a civilian air uh, flight training school, and they had a no, they had a, a, a uniform of sorts. But uh, they were great. They were great. Never had any trouble with the instructors. Actually, I think they were a very brave lot because uh, every time they let the student take over. Yeah, there's someone in the back seat who's totally inexperienced, and his, your life's in his hands. They, they were wonderful souls, actually. And I don't think they got the credit that they were due. Hmm. Did they ever do things to, what would they do to boost your confidence to make you feel like you knew what you were doing? <laughs> Anything come to mind? Well, the odd time they, <clears throat> no, they, they, they were, they were good. Uh, I never had an instructor that destroyed my confidence. Uh, they always worked with you and, and, and gently corrected your faults. Uh, one time we were flying along and all of a sudden the engine stopped or the throttle was thrown back. And the gods and the pilot said, there it is. It's all yours. You've got to make a dead stick landing. Uh, so you, you go, go through procedures of looking to pick out what field was, uh, you could land in. 
And, and when you're on skis in snow, it's not too bad. At least uh, uh, you can stay on top of the crust. But uh, I picked this field, and I'm turning around and looking at it. And, uh, I was thinking what the the air speed or the wind speed was like when we left the uh, the airfield. Well, it had picked up like about fourfold in the in meantime, and when I turned in on my on my landing run, I missed the <laughs> I missed the field by about a hundred yards. I would have run right into a fence. Anyway, they banged on the throttle and around we went again, and the pilot said, "Here." I'll show you what you did wrong. So up we go. Well, there was no way of knowing at the time what the wind was like. And uh, so he did exactly the same thing. He said, oh, well, I guess the wind's stronger than I thought it was. You did all right. So <laughs> you would have run, run into the fence, but so would have I. Yeah. So they were capable of making uh -huh. the odd little mistake, too. What's going through your head when something scary happens up in the air? Is, is there room for fear, or are you simply thinking of what you've got to do to get the plane down? Well, I think it's a combination of both. <clears throat> of course, fear generates uh, action. Hopefully. You've got to do something, and of course, all you know is what you've been taught, and there were, there were standard drills for everything. If the motor stopped, trying to get things going again, uh, where do you go? There was a drill for everything. So, uh, and if you were too high coming in, you had to side slip. There were techniques which uh, you were taught, and if you applied them, you'd be all right. So, you know, it was there, although sometimes you don't always remember what you should remember. Were there ever any crashes while you were at Prince Albert? Uh, just on the course before ours, there was one lad uh, uh, was practicing spins, and uh, it developed into what they call a flat spin. Most spins are you're going down, and you're sort of corkscrewing down. This one, for some reason, had developed into a flat spin, so he's spinning around like a, like a maple leaf seed. You see them spinning. Yeah. And he wasn't able to get out. He spun right into the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, he was still strapped to his uh, in his seat. Both legs were broken, and that was all that happened to him. So he was very fortunate. But Tiger Moth isn't a isn't a winner in when it comes to speed. So um, as a matter of fact, I was up one day, and the wind was around up high. It was, uh, I guess, 60 or 70 miles an hour. And I was going to tr practice spins, and I was slowing down. And I looked, and I was going backwards over the ground. And that's a bit of a shock. But uh, the wind was so high, and actually I'm going forwards through the air, but not, on, not according to the ground. Yeah. But uh, the, the tiger is not a, not a killer from speed. You know, just misjudgment is going to get you in trouble. Did you ever get lost up in the air? Pardon? Did you ever get lost up in the air? Well, that was the beauty of training in the prairies. Uh, all the roads run north, south, east, or west. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it is a bit, it can be confusing, though. Uh, and we just had the old magnetic compass, which did a lot of spinning around. And uh, you were pretty careful uh, about what direction you were going and where, where the airfield was at all times. You, you had areas where you went and trained. You're, you'd go to training area number three or four or six, whatever. You knew where it was. And uh, once you'd finished your training, you got this visual impression of where it is, and you got a map. You can get back. But, uh, at night, it's, uh, well, at night wasn't too bad either. It was more of a problem at Saskatoon when we got advanced training and went on longer cross-country trips. We didn't go far afield uh, on the Tiger Moth. Mm -hmm. uh, how long were you at Prince Albert, do you remember? Um, uh, I guess I started uh, flight training in uh, 
the end of uh, January, so uh, four months, uh, two months doing odd jobs, uh -huh. peanut wagon stuff, and, uh, clean up, washing, and then uh, two months, I think it was. Winter time is a good time to fly because your your weather's pretty steady. It's cold, but uh, it's smooth. So when you get airborne, you're not bouncing all over the place with updrafts like you can in the summertime. So it was a it was a nice time to train actually. Once you got over the cold. Uh, what'd you do for Christmas? You were there over. over well, the Christmas was really uh, was fun. Um, there was always a Red Cross canteen in the city, in the town that you were nearby. It was a fair hike into, I think about four miles or so to, from the airport to uh, Prince Albert. But they had a bus run in. And <clears throat> uh, they had a dance. And half a dozen of us went into this thing. I was dancing with this girl. Her name was Cameron. Good Scottish name. So we got chatting. And uh, uh, it came out that I played the bagpipes. Well, she said, oh, you've got, to, have you got them? I said, oh, yes. Oh, you've got to come to my house. My mom and dad will go crazy. So she invited me for dinner on the following Sunday. So I took my pipes and went, well, I ended up staying there for the Christmas week. Had a wonderful time. Oh, they were really good. Yeah, she had another sister and she had a brother. And her dad was uh, uh, head warden at the penitentiary. So, uh, but they loved the bagpipes. And I loved her cooking. And <laughs> so they were great, great people. Were you ever in contact with them again after that? Oh, by, uh, I never saw them again. But uh, uh, always sent cards at Christmas uh -huh. until they eventually, uh, the parents died. and. The kids are dispersed all over the place. But it was, you made great friends, and the people were so good. They really were. Hmm. What about home? Did you get a lot of letters from home? Well, I wrote every week, and Mom wrote every week. <clears throat> Dad wrote periodically. But you were so busy, you know, you didn't have a lot of time, and um, you did things like, uh, I was talking in the canteen at Prince Albert to a couple of the English lads. And, uh, they had got two weeks leave. And they'd got this before their course was started. So they didn't know what to do. I said, well, why don't you go out to Vancouver, see the West Coast? And they said, well, no, we couldn't afford the accommodation. I said, oh, don't worry. You could stay at my house. <laughs> I, I hadn't even asked my parents. <clears throat> they thought that was a great idea. So they got their train tickets and off they went. I still hadn't got, the, I didn't even phone. <clears throat> and uh, these two lads arrived on the front porch, knocked on the door. And, and uh, of course, they're in their Air Force uniforms. And uh, my dad opened the door and he said, yes. He said, oh, the, the one of them said, Alex sent it. <laughs> That's all they said. Alex said it. Oh, well, come in. Come in. Well, they stayed for about a week with my parents in Vancouver. And they had a wonderful time. Hmm. Hmm. But you did that sort of thing. Yeah. What about you? Did you make it home at all any at any point <coughs> during your training? No. No. I didn't get home until after wings, wing spray. Mm -hmm. And that was after service flying. Right. So let's talk about SFTS. Service School. flying number four in Saskatoon, Saskatoon. on the Cessna Crane. And uh, when you graduated, you either went multi-engine or single engine. And uh, the big demand really was for multi-engine at the time. So went to on the Cessna Crane, and we, we did much the same there. We, uh, we did Joe Jobs until our course started. And uh, the course was a mixed bag of Canadians and Brits. And, uh, but once we started, uh, that too was the, the intensity was the same as ITS and, and elementary youth. 
really applied yourself, but now you're in the final stage, and if you foul up at all, you're out. And numbers were, some were taken off, and they went on to become air gunners. That was quite often that happened. They still wanted to stay air crew. But um, it, was, uh, it was great. But you were talking about, do you ever get lost? And that was sort of funny in the air, because you take off on a night cross country in the prairies, and it, the sky is just alight with stars that you can see for miles. Well, once you got above Saskatoon, you could see the lights of uh, Yorkton. You could see the lights of uh, all the places around. And by the size of the glow, you knew what it was. You could never get lost. And uh, it, was, it was sort of funny going across country. You set your compass and uh, fly your course. But you all, always knew where you were by the lights. Crystal clear. Mind you, it would be a different uh, ball game if you were doing this over, over Europe, where, of course, everything would be blacked out at night. So it would be difficult. But in the prairies, it wasn't too difficult. How was flying the Cornell in comparison to the Tiger Moth? Whole new ball game? I flew the Cornell out here. Uh, at Brandon, a little later on in my career, uh, when I was eventually in the Army, um, I was, uh, a wire came through saying, when I was stationed at Rivers, and I was a parachute instructor then, and the wire said, go into Brandon and do continuation flying. And Ed McGill was the chief instructor there, and, and, and the field was named after Ed McGill. And he had flown mosquitoes during the Second World War. So I'd come in and he'd take me on a circuit on a Tiger or a Stinson, or he also had a Cornell. Cornell was quite different. It, when it hit the ground, it usually stayed there. The Tiger bounced a lot. And uh, actually, the Tiger and the Cessna were quite similar. They were both very light. And so if you didn't sink down carefully, you, you could do a little bouncing around. It was, it was a nice plane to fly. But I didn't get a lot of time in it, so I can't really give a, uh, a profound <laughs> report on the comparison. Did anyone from Prince Albert come to Saskatoon as well, of, of your classmates at, at Prince Albert? Yeah, there were some. Some. <clears throat> Some of them came, uh, but uh, not many. I think of only about half a dozen of them came with me. And at this point, you're thinking you're getting close to heading overseas? Oh, or, yes. Or hoping, anyhow. Yeah. yeah. You know that after you, you graduate, you get your wings, then the next thing is OTU, Operational Training Unit, wherever that may be. And then you got on to what you would you called real airplanes, the, the ones that were being used in operations. Uh, so that was a new, a different ball game entirely. Yeah. But at least we were getting the basic. And were, in general, the men excited about the thought of going overseas? Oh, yes. Yeah. Definitely. I, 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 everybody felt the same way. I think, to be really honest, uh, my biggest fear was that the war was going to end before I could get involved. And I was really worried about it. You know, that's dumb now in retrospect. But uh, you put so much of your heart and soul into this that you wanted to put it to use. Yeah. And you had no, uh, of course, if, uh, you know, if we didn't have any young people, we wouldn't have wars because there'd be nobody around to fight them. Because young people never think of what can happen, really. It was, uh, the whole Commonwealth Air Training Plan was a, just a, a fantastic experience. And uh, you met people from all over. It helped unify, I think it helped, did a lot to unify Canada. You met people from every province. And you realized they're just like you, you know, with 
we led pretty secluded lives prior to the war. There wasn't much traveling. People rarely moved out of the district. So, uh, and of course, there wasn't the same amount of air travel as there is now. There weren't as many cars. Uh, we never owned a car in the family. And the uh, first time I ever drove was uh, when I was at Saskatoon. And there was a satellite airfield where we used to go and practice night landings and takeoffs. And uh, they, lay, they, they had no electric lights there. The, to mark the runway, we laid out little flare pots. You, laid, you put them out and then lit them, and they would flicker away. Well, this one night at, uh, at this airfield, uh, I was asked to go and set out the pots. And so the station wagon, or the truck, was there. I climbed in, and I didn't know how to drive. But I got it going, and I, I didn't tear out the gear shift. I managed to make my way up the runway and lay out the flare pots. That was my first experience, and I was, what, uh, 19 then. Hmm. So it, uh, it was quite an experience. Um, graduation was fun, I mean, uh, exciting, and uh, to get your wings. And I remember, uh, of course, all travel then was by train. None of it was by air. And I went down and climbed on board the train. I'm sitting there going home on two weeks, wings, wings leave. And uh, this young sergeant air gunner got on and sat down and looked around. I, he sat down beside me. We started talking. He had just got his wings. And uh, he was going home on, on leave. And I said, uh, got any plans? He said, oh, I'm getting married. I said, oh, that's wonderful. He said, yeah, but I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, uh, I haven't got a best man. He was from Vancouver. So I said, well, you know, no big deal. I could do it for you if you want. So he said, would you? I said, sure. I'm not doing anything in particular. So I, he gave me the details, and I ended up being his best man. And sort of a follow-up to that was sort of cute. Uh, Fifty years later, now that was uh, uh, 45. That was, for, no, that was 44. December 44. 94 uh, was 50 years later. And uh, my sister-in-law was reading the paper in Vancouver, and she read a small article in there about this chap wanted to know if anyone knew where Alec Matheson was. Uh, I'm having my 50th, or we're having our 50th wedding anniversary in December, and he was our best man. And I don't know where he is. Well, she, and then he described he had been a pilot, and, and uh, that was the last he knew. So anyway, she phoned me and said, read out this note and said, is that you? And I said, yeah, I guess it is, because I was best man for this fellow who was a, a sergeant air gunner and getting married. Well, do you want to be found? <laughs> so I said, sure, that's sort of exciting. So she phoned him, gave him my number, and, uh, and he called. <clears throat> uh, they were hold, wanting to hold it in December, but uh, I was involved in things, and my best month was uh, October. And uh, he said, all right, we'll hold our anniversary in October. So oh. Peg and I went out, and, uh, wow. and uh, we were at his 50th anniversary, which was sort of exciting. And had you been in contact at all after they Never. got married? Just just stood up for him, and, and then you went your separate ways? And, yeah, and well, of course, I was, I was still involved. But, uh, right. When I, when I was home on leave, that's when I got this wire uh, saying that you're now on the active air reserve subject to recall because we have more pilots than we can employ. And uh, if we need you, we'll recall you. 
Well, I sat on my bed and I cried. I was so upset. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I got, I got a little annoyed and I said, to hell with them. The war's still on. I can't sit here, so I, I'll join the army. And so I went and joined the army, infantry, and at the same time signified I would, I would be quite happy to go airborne. And uh, I ended up on a course in Vernon, British Columbia, with, there were 36 of us, and it was rather unique. They were all ex-Air Force in the same boat as I was in. And they wanted to, can, they wanted to do something so uh, we were together, and we had a great course. Mm. And uh, most of them, a number of them, went on to stayed in after uh, the war, as I did. Mm. And a number served in rivers, where I ended up as a parachute instructor eventually. And a number of them were there. So it was, it was rather unique. And at least you're still around planes, still able to. Yeah, incorporate I that, that into that. your life. Yeah, but then I ended up in tanks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this might be an impossible question to answer, but how did training in the Army compare to training in the Air Force? <laughs> Besides the obvious doing very different things, what, what were, what was... Uh, well, the major thing, I, I think, between air and, and, and land is, uh, are the numbers involved. Like air crew, you have a crew. And be it two of you, be it 10 or 12 of you, that's pretty well your team. And you're very tight along with your ground crew. Um, in the uh, training in the, in the, in the Army, uh, as an officer, you're involved with men. And uh, that is how you accomplish things. Uh, your, man, your manpower may be a platoon, it may be a company, it may be a battalion, whatever. But they're groups of men. And you're always concerned about how they get there, how they're fed, how they're looked after, um, how they're bedded down. You're responsible as the officer for all of these. Uh, in the air, the Air Force, of course, the airfields looked after this. And you had specialized people looking after this. And everything was pretty well in the same area. You took off from a, an airdrome and you landed at an airdrome. And uh, the difficulty was in the air. On the ground, it was a problem of supply and maintenance and uh, keeping the planes in the air. But it was, it's quite different in that respect. Did anyone from your graduation class go overseas? Uh, well, of course, the, the English lads did. But where they ended up, I, I don't know. Cause, uh, you were on the on the move all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I've read of uh, I read of one class. Uh, there were forty three on it. Uh, they all went overseas, and only three survived out of forty three. So the casualty rate was very high. Yeah. But uh, uh, I was lucky in the final analysis. I I didn't have to put my skills to test and. Uh, find out whether or not I, I had the ability <clears throat> to survive. But uh, it was uh, certainly one of the most exciting chapters in my life. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Do you still wish you could have gone over? If you could go back and change things, would you change? Well, so now I'm gone? a little more, <laughs> I, I appreciate a little more the dangers and the hazards, and I think I was just very, very fortunate uh, to have just been a tad too young to, to get into it. The way it worked out, I just didn't quite make it. And uh, I was really fortunate. Well, any other stories come to mind? <laughs> no, I think um, uh, my uh, my experience in the, uh, I could mention when I was getting uh, out of the Air Force, when they, uh, I had to go down to Jericho, which was uh, on English Bay, and it was a seaplane base, and they had fairy swordfish there, they had 
Catalin is there. And uh, that's where they were demobilizing people. And I remember getting on the, the bus, and there was an airman there. Uh, he got on, and he was a pilot. He had obviously uh, been uh, a fighter pilot. I, well, I imagine he was. But his face was burnt. Oh, it was terrible. And I, I think that was a real shock to me because you realize that uh, it's not fun and games. Uh, it's damn serious business. And uh, he would bear those scars for life. And his whole face was sort of mottled purple. And uh, whether or not he was eventually skin grafted or not, I don't know. But uh, it sure shook me. Yeah. And uh, you realize that this isn't fun. And uh, it, it's uh, not the type of thing we should uh, rejoice in. We rejoice in the fact there are people willing to serve their country, but we don't rejoice in the fact that many of them were died, died or got seriously wounded or injured. And when I saw this man, I realized that he must have gone through the agonies of hell. And because uh, I'd read Peter McQuarrie, I was known as Alec A L E C, but. Uh, uh, the